Hello and welcome back to another video in the how to make add-ons tutorial series for Minecraft Bedrock Edition by me, Foxy no -Tail. In the last video we looked at making a basic entity and in this video we're going to look into even more depth in how to spawn your entities into your world. We're going to be looking beyond spawn eggs at items that you can craft that will place your entities as well as spawn rules that rely on the mob caps of the game and the in-game mechanics to spawn your entities within the world and a whole bunch of other things around those so sit back sit tight and enjoy as we take a trip down spawning late we're just gonna get on with teaching you how to do spawning all right jeez don't forget that everything that I discuss in these tutorials is available from foxynotel.com forward slash how to and that includes the resource pack and behavior pack from today's video. Make sure you go there, check that out and download those now so that you can work along with this video and see exactly how it's all done. So in the last video we created a spawn egg which is a nice and easy way to get entities into the world and we can retexture them to pretty much look like whatever we want. And that's absolutely great and it's nice and easy and it means we can spam as many entities in the world as we like. But if you're making an add-on that's going to be used in survival Minecraft, then spawn eggs are a bit of a problem. Because there exist these things called monster spawners and monster spawners can take any egg or spawn egg in the game and then duplicate the entity based on whatever egg is clicked on it with. And that works in survival as well. So if you've got a chuck spawn egg like this and you click it on a monster spawner, you'll get a little chuck on the inside of there and eventually a chuck will pop out, which means you're now duplicating entities, which isn't ideal. So we need to look at some other ways of spawning in entities into our game. Which brings us back to Visual Studio Code and the workspace we're going to be working on today, which is exactly the same as we worked on in the last video. If you're not sure how to make a workspace or set one up in the way we've done, I did cover this at the beginning of these tutorials. So make sure you go back and check that out. Otherwise, you're going to be a little bit lost. Anyway, before we go into anything to do with Chuck, we are going to go into the vanilla Minecraft data folders. And in specific, we're going to go into the behavior packs, the vanilla behavior pack, and we're going to be looking at the vanilla spawn rules for all of the vanilla mobs and entities. And the first one I'm going to check out is the cow. So these spawn rules basically tell the game what to do when it's looking to spawn in an entity. And the game's pretty much always looking to spawn in an entity. And what it does is it reads through these files and says, ah, is this one a valid entity I can spawn based on the criteria inside of these spawn rules? So there's a few key things that we need to look at. First of all, we've got the population control. You'll see for the cow, the population control is animal, which means that it is a part of the animal mob cap or the global animal mob cap. If we was to look at a pillager, however, you'll see the population is pillager. You'll also notice that the pillager doesn't have any spawn rules because pillagers don't spawn unless they're part of a patrol. If we go to a witch, however, or if we even look at a creeper or a drowned, you'll notice they all have the population control of monster. The monster population control is the hostile mob cap. Those are basically mobs or entities which are controlled within that cap. And there are a whole bunch of conditions for each one within those files. So we're going to go back to the cow. We're going to keep things nice and simple. And we're going to look at how a cow spawns. So a cow is within the passive mob cap, which is known as the animal population control. And it will spawn on the surface because it has a component that says it will spawn on the surface. There is no component, however, to say it will spawn in a cave. So it will only spawn in the surface, which means a cow can't spawn with a block above its head. If we take a look at a skeleton, however, for example, you'll see it has spawns on surface and spawns underground, which means it will spawn with a block above his head or in a cave and on the surface as well. Going back to the cow, it also has a spawn on block filter, which is a grass block. So that says that a cow can only spawn on a grass block. However, if we were to look at the moose room instead of a cow, you'll see that the block filter is completely gone from there. So a moose room can technically spawn on any block. Now back to the cow, it has a brightness filter with a minimum and a maximum number. This is the daytime block light 
value. So minimum says a cow can't spawn in light levels less than seven or above 15. And it's also saying there that it's not adjusting the spawn rate based on the weather. So it doesn't matter whether it's raining or a thunderstorm or snowing, a cow still requires those light levels to spawn. We've then got weight, which is basically the probability of that particular entity being spawned within the population control of animal. So if we open up a chicken, for instance, you'll see it has a default weight of 10. That says that the chicken is more likely to be spawned than a cow if both of those entities meet the right requirements to be spawned. So when the game is looking to spawn in an entity and it says, ah, yeah, a cow and a chicken are both valid spawns in this particular location, which one's it more likely to pick? It's more likely to pick the chicken because it has a higher default weight. We've then got a herd size, which basically says how many entities are going to be spawned. The minimum is two and the maximum is three. So that's saying it's going to spawn either two cows or three cows when it chooses to spawn a cow. And then the last thing for the cow is the biome filter. And this one can be a little bit complicated and confusing as well, because it says that the cow will only spawn in animal biomes or biomes that have the tag animal. So that's a little bit confusing. Let's for a second look at the fox spawning rules. We know foxes will only spawn in the taker biome. And yes, the biome filter there clearly says that the biome has to have the value taker for the fox to spawn. So why does the cow have the animal value and not something like plains or beach or forest or something like that? Well, it's just to make life a little bit simpler although it's kind of complicated at the same time. Let's take a slight detour now to actually look at biome definitions to try and understand exactly what that means. So we're going to come out of spawn rules. We're going to scroll down in our data folder till we get to a folder called definitions. And in there, there's a folder called biomes. And if we open that up, there are the definitions for every single biome in the game. Speaking of beach, let's have a look at that one. You'll see that the beach biome is the has the identifier beach which means that is the name of the biome it's got a whole bunch of components which we're not particularly interested in here but then it has these bits at the bottom which don't have any information in them but these are the tags these are the biome tags so it's tagged with beach which means it's a beach biome it's tagged with monster which means monsters can spawn on the beach it's tagged with overworld which means it's an overworld biome and it's tagged with warm which means it has a warm temperate climate so notice the beach doesn't have the animal tag so cows cannot spawn at the beach unless we change the cow tag here from animal to beach that means that then cows would be able to spawn at the beach but because it's on animal, it can't. But some animals can spawn at the beach, and this is where it gets confusing. If we go back to our spawn rules and look at turtles, you'll see that the turtle spawn rules for biomes is that it has to be beach and warm as well. So the turtles will only spawn on a warm beach. Notice the turtle doesn't have the animal biome tag though, because the turtle can't spawn in any other biomes other than a warm beach. So you can get incredibly specific with exactly where you want your mobs to spawn. Now, in terms of Chuck, we're not going to be worrying too much about this because we're actually going to be spawning him using the crafting recipe. But this is quite important, and I think it's worth going through in a little bit more detail for the sake of these tutorials. So back on my favorite website, bedrock.dev, if we go to the entity section and click on data-driven spawning, there is a section called spawn rules, and this will give us all of the different components that we can use to spawn mobs. So we've already met spawns on surface, but there's another one here called spawns underwater. And I bet you can guess what that's used for. We've got the brightness filter, which we discussed, the weight, which is the priority of the mob spawning. And we've also got a difficulty filter. So we can say, actually, we're only going to spawn this mob in peaceful, easy, normal or hard difficulties. You can choose which one that you want and notice that is a maximum and a minimum for this so you can say actually i will have this mob spawn in in normal and hard mode but not peaceful or easy which is how you can stop mob spawning in the different piece in the different difficulty modes 
So we've got the herd size, which we looked at, that actually have a few more internal components that we actually saw in those files. We're not going to go into detail on that today. If you want to find more out about that, I suggest you check this website out and other tutorials that might teach you a little bit more about that. We've obviously covered the biome filter, and there is one more that's really interesting called the density limit. The density limit basically says how many of this particular type of mob will spawn either underground or overground. And this one's important. Let's get rid of our cow and open up the creeper spawn rules. You will see in the creeper spawn rules that there is a density limit on the surface of five. This means that the game cannot or shouldn't spawn any more than five creepers at once on the surface. Now this doesn't include named creepers, basically creepers that you've given a name to, or a creeper that has become persistent for whatever reason. This is only creepers that are out and about that have spawned in randomly or spawned in through the game's natural mechanics that haven't been fiddled with by the player. So basically it says the game goes, ah, is there more than five creepers already? Yes, okay, well we won't include any more creepers on this particular spawn and this exists for quite a lot of the hostile mobs again if we go to drowns you'll see that has a density limit on the surface of five as well notice however that the zombie however doesn't have a density limit neither does a spider or a skeleton and that's because they're actually controlled by the global density limits and the global density caps but the game is saying here that creepers are specifically being targeted we don't want too many creepers spawning at once because creepers are dangerous and they cause grief into your world so the developers here have gone actually let's not have more than five creepers in the world at once because that could be dangerous so you might be thinking we've already got quite a lot of control over where and how our mobs will spawn, but there's even more control than that if we look deeper into these vanilla files. And this is why I keep saying it's really important to actually check out the vanilla files. If we look at the pillager patrol files themselves, how pillagers patrol, there's a whole bunch of components here that are not shown on bedrock.dev. You can see here, we've got a mob event filter, which basically is the in-game event that triggers the villager patrols or the pillager patrols to spawn. Now, we can't really use that for our mobs, but we could hook into that for a different mob if we wanted it to follow the same rules as pillager patrols. We can also look at the world age filter. This is saying how old is the world before it will try and spawn a mob. And that's in 6,000 watt. It could be seconds, it could be ticks. It's ticks, let's just put it that way. So after 6,000 ticks of the world being open, then it will look at whether or not this mob can spawn or this entity can spawn. We've also got a delay filter, which basically says after a mob has spawned, how long are we going to give it until we look at spawning another one? So let's say you want a relatively rare mob or a mob that you don't want to spawn particularly regularly. You can say, right, after we've already had one instance of this mob spawning, we're going to wait from this amount of time to this amount of time before we try and spawn another one in. There's also such thing as a permute type or basically the permutation of the mob that will spawn. So we can say when this spawn rule is triggered, actually, I want a baby version of this mob or I want of this particular type of this mob. And those link into the components within our actual entity files so we can tell it exactly which type of mob that we're building within our entity that we want to spawn. There's also a player in a village filter so that we can detect whether the player is in a village, whether it will spawn this mob or not. So maybe you want to only spawn a mob when the player is within a village. Maybe it's a different type of iron golem that you're creating or a whole new type of golem or a new type of villager. And you don't want them just spawning anywhere in the world. You want them spawning around the player when that player is within a village. That's something you can do. And there is a distance filter, which is really important. This one says how far away from the player that the mob will spawn. So you've got a minimum and a maximum. So you can have something spawn right in front of the player's face 
or you can have it spawn a long way away. So you can say the minimum is zero, the maximum is 100, and that will spawn, that mob will spawn anywhere between you and 100 blocks away, or you can put whatever values you want. So even though we're not going to be using these spawn rules to affect how Chuck's going to be spawned into the game, let's do it anyway, just so that you've got an idea of how that works. So I'm going to go back to our behavior pack folder, and within that I'm going to make a new folder, and it's going to be called... You guessed it, spawn rules. So within that, we're going to have a new file. And yes, you guessed it. It's going to be called chug.json. And it is another JSON file. And then we're going to go to our cow that's within the vanilla spawn rules folder. And we're going to copy all of that by hitting control C, go into chuck and hitting control V to paste all that. So chuck is now spawning like a cow. Or he almost is because there's a couple of things we need to change. First of all, we need to change the identifier to make it match Chuck. So let's go back to Chuck's entity file and let's just push that over to the right hand side just so that we've got it there so we can see it. And we can see Chuck's identifier is FNT Chuck. So let's change that there to the FNT Chuck. And now this file will respond to Chuck particularly. Now in the previous Chuck pack, Chuck was actually controlled by the spawn rules and the spawn rules we used were a little bit different. So the population control for Chuck was monster. He was actually part of the hostile mob cap and he would only spawn on iron blocks on the surface. So not with the block above his head. You'll notice he also had a default weight of 100. So there was a high chance of him spawning, but he would only spawn within one block away from the player up to eight blocks away from the player. So he would only spawn close to the player. And another filter that we haven't looked at yet is the height filter we can actually control how high up in the world an entity will spawn and we had it that chuck would only spawn above 250 blocks in the world which meant that you had to be pretty high up with a big platform of iron blocks in order to get chuck to spawn we also had a density limit so only one chuck could spawn at once and none could spawn in the underground and we had a herd size as well saying that only one chuck would spawn at once and that all worked pretty well so i'm going to save that and i'm going to launch minecraft again and i'm going to go into the world that we're working on for this particular add-on and then i'm going to run a command and here we go we are now up above a big platform of iron blocks high up in the sky which is a nice big area for Chuck to be able to spawn. However, Chuck is not going to spawn because on this particular world, if we go to the settings, we have mob spawning turned off because we didn't want random mobs spawning in the world. So we're going to need to turn that on. So hopefully now Chuck will be able to spawn. The night is coming upon us though, so we should probably set it to daytime. And there he goes, literally just popped in next to me. I was about to uh, write in another command to make sure it worked. Let's see that again. Let's get rid of him and let's go back over here. And let's see if we can get Chuck to spawn in again. Actually, well, there we go. On camera. There we go. So Chuck now spawns. And we won't get any more Chucks. This will be the only Chuck that spawns because he has the density cap of one. So there we go. Spawn rules working. They are nice and easy to do. And they're very, very powerful. You can get entities spawning naturally however you want. But that's not how we're going to do Chuck this time. This time we're actually going to be using items. Which means we do have to dabble with experimental mode. Now, I don't normally recommend making add-ons that require experimental features because, generally speaking, those features are in development still and are subject to change. I normally recommend making add-ons for stable release because then anyone can use them. If you require these experimental features, then it's unlikely that people on realms or on servers will be able to make the use of your add-ons. However, there is one particular experimental feature that's been an experimental feature for an incredibly long time. And I think it's probably due to come out of experimental mode very soon, which means by the time you're watching this video in the future, it's probably already available to you. But if it's not, you need to come to your world settings and tick the holiday creator features experimental toggle and click continue. It will create a copy of your world. And now within that, we can use custom blocks and custom items, but not the old fashioned custom items, the new ones, which are incredibly powerful. And that's what we're going to be using to create Chuck. Now, the problem with these custom items, because they're new, is there is nothing to copy from the vanilla files. You know how I like to go to the vanilla ones and copy and paste what they've got and tweak it to make use of what we need to do. 
We can't do that now. We have to get a little bit more inventive with, with how we find our information so we know what we're doing. So yes, that means we're going to be going back to our favorite website, bedrock.dev, and we're going to be going to the item section of this website. And in there, wish this will have pretty much most of the information we need in order to make this work. But before we go down that rabbit hole, let's at least put our file structure together. So we're going to go back to our behavior pack folder and create yet another new folder. And this one is going to be called item. And within that, we are going to create a new file and it is going to be called chuck.json yet again. We're going to have a chuck item this time. It doesn't matter that it's got the na same name as something else because this is an item. So I could sit here and look at this blank file all day and scratch my head and think, ah, well, I could go through the bedrock.dev thing and try and figure it out and ah, it's going to be kind of difficult. Or I can cheat again. Now, there's a couple of ways we could treat cheat. We could actually use the bridge program, which has all of this information already in there and get it from there. But I don't like bridge. I like copying and pasting. So, many, many ago, there was a beta version of Minecraft Bedrock Edition known as beta version 1.16.100.50. And that beta version just happened to come out around about the same time as these custom item and custom block experimental features. And within that beta version, within the data folder, and within the behavior packs folder, and the vanilla folder, there was a new folder called items new and that items new had all of the items in the game written as data driven items which is exactly what we're looking for so whilst the items in the game such as food apples and golden apples and fish the the stuff that you can't really do a great deal with already existed these new items that had all of the new information on were left in the game for us developers to have a look at and there are some really useful ones here like the cauldron item for instance if we look at the cauldron item we will see that the cauldron item has this fantastic new component called a block placer and it would place a block called the cauldron when you clicked something with the cauldron item we've also got items for armor which have never existed in the game before and if we look at those we can see that they are enchantable for feet, they're also damageable and repairable with certain items and wearable as well. All of these components never existed before with the old item system, but now they do and they're accessible to us. So what we could do is copy these ones instead of, you know, doing it ourselves. So let's find an item that Chuck would most likely resemble. How about the boat? The boat is an entity. So therefore, when you click something with the boat item, it creates an entity in the world, which is exactly what we want. And if we look at this here, we'll see that there is a component for the boat known as Entity Placer. Now that's perfect. That's exactly what we want for Chuck. We want him to be an Entity Placer. So let's copy and paste all of the boat stuff for Chuck. And we're going to change the identifier to FNT Chuck, as we did before. And we're going to get rid of the max stack size and the stack by data. And we're just going to leave the entity placer there. So now we could technically get an item in the game known as a Chuck that when we click it on the ground, it's going to place a boat. We don't want it to place a boat. We actually want it to place a Chuck, don't we? So let's change the entity to FNT Chuck as well. So now that's pretty much it for Chuck. Apart from we want to actually give the item a texture so it doesn't look a bit weird. And we actually do that with the new items inside the behavior pack and not inside the resource pack. Basically, that used to be the case that you would have an item in the behavior pack and one in the resource pack so that you could texture it and make it do what you wanted. But the developers realized that that was a little bit of a convoluted system. If you're creating a new custom item with the behavior pack, it's pointless then controlling that with a separate resource pack so that they've allowed us to do some basic control of the texture with the behavior pack. So all we're going to do is create a new component and that is Minecraft icon and do a colon, open up that component with the braces, put a comma between both of those so that uh, they'll work together and then we're going to put in texture 
colon, and then whatever texture we want it to be. Now, we actually want this texture to be the same one we've got for our spawn egg. So let's now go back to the chuck entity within our resource pack this time and look at what it was called. The chuck item is what we named it. So let's put the texture as chuck item there. So that's pretty much it for our item file. And we can now check if that's in the game. However, I did make a little bit of a mistake earlier that we need to correct. I actually called the item folder within our behavior pack item, and it should be items with an S, which means that it wouldn't have shown up in game. So now hopefully if we go back to Minecraft and load up our experimental world, we should be able to find that item in the game. So I'm going to do a give command to at S, which is self or me and if i type in chuck now you'll see there are two there is fnt chuck which is our new chuck item which is throwing up a whole lot of errors and we've got the spawn egg which was already there so if i just do fnt chuck and give myself that item you'll see that it's there kind of but it doesn't actually do anything and it says in the uh, in the errors that chuck requires either an icon atlas or an icon texture so we've done our textures wrong that's fine we're learning let's get it right well there's a couple of things that we need to look at here first of all we got format version 1.10 that needs updating to 1.16.100 which is when these new items were actually put into the game so that should help with certain things. And in fact, coming back into the game, that is exactly what the problem was. We just needed to have the right format for our file so the game knew how to handle those components. And there we go. We now have the item chuck, which looks exactly the same as the spawn egg, but you'll see it's called item. So now if we click the ground with that, you'll see that it is placing the entity chuck. And if we put a spawn cage down, we can't actually click the item into the spawn cage we can put the chuck spawn egg into the monster spawner but we cannot put the item into the monster spawner but otherwise it does exactly the same thing so we've now created an item using experimental features that does exactly the same thing as a spawn egg but doesn't have the flaws of a spawn egg so now all we need to do is to be able to get hold of that item in the game in order to get chuck which we're going to do with a crafting recipe. Now, there are two types of crafting recipes in Minecraft. There are shaped crafting recipes and shapeless crafting recipes. And the difference between those is how you place the items in the crafting table. A shapeless crafting recipe means that you can craft your item with any layout. All it requires are the exact items, but it doesn't matter how you put them in the crafting table. They will allow you to still get the item out the other end. Whereas a shaped crafting recipe has to have the items in exactly the right places in respect of each other in order to actually craft that item. So you can see here, I can't craft a torch with the stick or the coal in the wrong place. They have to be relative to each other. And we're going to be using a shaped crafting recipe for Chuck. And the crafting recipe for Chuck is going to be relatively expensive because Chuck is incredibly powerful and we don't want too many of them wandering around in the world because, well, it's going to be a chunk load at the end of the day and that would cause quite a lot of lag. So we're going to go over to our crafting table. We're going to take a little bit of a look at those Chucks over there and think, I know exactly what material you're made out of, sir. You are going to be a block of iron a piece of yellow wool or concrete i guess yellow concrete could work and a nether star and that is what is going to be used to create chuck however of course chuck is going to need some redstone in him in order to make him work nicely and i think the best way of conducting that redstone around his body would be with some diamond i think diamond would be the best conductor of that redstone in order to create chuck and make him work properly and you know what, for good measure, we should probably add some netherite in there as well, just to make his casing nice and strong so he doesn't get hurt. And therefore creating a crafting recipe that's not easy to get hold of, which means there aren't going to be lots of chucks running about in the world. But we also don't need to build out a giant platform up at world height in order to spawn him in. So back in Visual Studio Code, we can get rid of our chuck file. We can go back to our behavior pack section and create yet another new folder. And this one is going to be called Recipes. And within that, we're going to create a new file. And you're never going to guess what this file is going to be called. That's right, chuck.json. And yes, at this point, I'm going to do a bit of copy and pasting because it's the easiest way to do it. So we're going to go to Behavior Packs. 
We're going to go to vanilla. We're going to go to recipes. And we're going to just pick a recipe that is a shaped crafting recipe that we can use to modify to create chuck. Let's go for the good old diamond chest plate and let's move this over to the right so we've got access to it on the right hand side and let's do the old copy paste. So control A to select all, control C to copy and control V to paste. And of course the identifier is not going to be Minecraft a diamond chest plate. It is of course going to be FNT Chuck and it is a shaped crafting recipe and then we need to define the pattern and the items at the moment each one of these x's in this crafting grid imagine that is the nine by nine crafting grid each one of those x's is a space in the grid and that x is referred to as the item the diamond in this particular case now we can use any symbols here we can use s's or we can use hashes or we can use a's and b's and c's Basically, any symbol there then would refer to an item here. So if we've got a hash there, we can have the X as a diamond and we could have the hashtag as an emerald. So now if I save that, so if I save that with an emerald up there and an emerald there and leave that as it is and go back into the game, you'll see that if we come to our crafting grid and make a diamond chest plate, that still exists, but we should also now be able to make one by doing the crafting recipe we've just added and there you go we can make the diamond chest plate with the crafting recipe we've just done so now we're just going to do the same recipe but for chuck okay so i have created the pattern the x's are going to be the netherite blocks now i'm assuming the netherite block will have the id netherite underscore block but it might not have and if you want to know what all of the ids for the items are in minecraft there is another handy website Going to minecraft.fandom.com forward slash wiki forward slash bedrock edition data values or the link in the description below, you will see that there is a list of pretty much every single block in the game. And all I do is I hit control F to bring up the search bar within Google Chrome and I type in the block I'm looking for. In this instance, it is netherite block and it just happens to be called netherite underscore block, which is wonderful. So I can copy that and I can bring it to Visual Studio Code and paste it in there to make sure I spelt it right. The D in our crafting grid is the diamond. So that is not a normal diamond, it's actually a diamond block. So we'll do diamond underscore block. The I is an iron block and the wool is yellow wool, which means we need to actually define what wool type it is. Now we can't actually just type in yellow underscore wool, that won't work. Now, coming back to our website, if we actually search for wool and then click on wool, it gives us a page that tells us all about wool. And if we scroll down far enough, it'll tell us what the namespaces are for Java Edition, which is actually really nice and easy. Because basically, they've got white wool, orange wool, magenta wool, light blue wool and whatnot. Whereas in Bedrock Edition, they just have wool. And that's not ever so useful for us because we want the color of the wool. And the color of the wool is determined by the data value, which is yeah quite difficult to get hold of. So now what we need to do is tell the crafting recipe that it has to be a particular color of wool by explaining to it what the data value is, which is a little bit tricky. However, fortunately for us, we do happen to have our vanilla recipes on hand in our data folder. And if we go to something that's been dyed, for instance, let's go to blue dye from cornflower and we click on that, we can see that all we need to do is add in a data value underneath our item. So we've got the item Minecraft red flower and the data value nine to tell it exactly which flower that is. So going to our chug recipe, we've got the item is wool. And if we do a comma and then data colon and then the data number. So which one is yellow wool? Yellow wool is four. So we just put in four there. And that now tells the game it has to be yellow wool. And the hashtag in our recipe is obviously the nether star. That I believe is pretty much it, but we actually want the resulting item to be the new chuck item we've created. So FNT chuck. And that should, providing I haven't made any spelling mistakes, be exactly what we need. Let's go back to Minecraft and let's go to our crafting table. And let's put in the netherite and let's put in the diamond and the redstone and the iron block and the nether star and the wall. And it's not going to work because I've just remembered I didn't do the redstone block. 
So let's go back to Visual Studio Code. You'll see here that for the R, I've got Netherite block instead of Redstone block. So I'm going to change that and save it, but I'm actually still technically in the game, which means that if I get rid of that and grab another bit of Netherite and put it there, you'll see that I did get it right, but I also got it wrong. So all we need to do is log out the game now and log back in again. Because remember, we're using the development resource pack folders and put the items back in again. So redstone, netherite, diamond, the nether star, iron and wool. And we can now make the chuck item. Before we do that, though, let's just prove that we can't use any other color of wool. It has to be yellow wool that's in there. So that is how you define your crafting recipe and make your item. And now we have the chuck item in the game that we can then put on the ground and turn into a chuck, which is wonderful. The last thing we need to do in our Visual Studio code is to go to our text file. Now it is the resource pack text file we need to go to. So we'll go to our resource pack folder, texts and ENUS lang. And what we're going to do is we're going to copy and paste the entity.fnt.chuck.name and we're going to change it to item.fnt.chuck, but we don't need the name. And then we save that. And now when we go back into the game, like so, we should hopefully find that our item in our hand is now called Chuck. It is. So now it's going to be a little bit confusing which one the spawn egg is and which one is not the spawn egg because obviously, yeah, the, mm, yeah. So why don't we just get rid of the confusion by getting rid of the spawn egg altogether and stopping Chuck from being able to be brought into the game via a spawn egg. That's really easy to do. All we're going to do is save and quit. Go back to Visual Studio Code and we're going to go back to our behavior pack, entities, Chuck file. And here it says is spawnable within the description. We're just going to change that to false. Now, there will be no spawn eggs for Chuck at all. Even though we've defined one in the resource pack folder, it won't exist. It's been taken out of the game. So go back to our game. Change it today because it's a little bit dark. And now we'll have a look for that spawn egg by doing give at s Chuck. You'll see there's only one list in there and it is FNT Chuck, not FNT spawn underscore egg underscore Chuck. And there we go. We can do that. And we now have Chuck in the game. And just to prove this is not a spawn egg, let's try and put it on the spawner cage. It won't go in. So there we go. We've now covered all of the different main waves of spawning your entities into the game. Now, there are a couple of other aspects, such as spawning things in with commands or functions, things like that. We're not going to cover that. That's not important right now. We've covered spawn eggs. We've covered the recipes to create custom items. And we've covered the spawn rules, which is everything that I wanted to do for today. So in the next video, we're going to be covering despawning, which is how to get rid of your entities, either by killing them or by clicking on them on other methods as well, such as distance despawning and natural despawning and persistence of entities as well. So that's coming up in the very next video. But for now, I would like to say thank you all very much for watching this one. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please do leave a like. If you haven't already, please do consider subscribing and hopefully I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye.